What is the role of religion in our ever-changing world? From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Issues of Faith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Issues of Faith. Glad you are with us. We are talking today about the intersection of science and religion. And there is some new research coming out of MTSU. We're going to talk to the, the lead researcher on that. Happy to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Barnes. She is an MTSU science um, education researcher. Dr. Barnes joins us, as everyone does now, by Zoom. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So, all right, a science and education researcher. What, is that, what does that mean? So yeah, so I am a professor in the biology department here at MTSU, but um, different from my other biologist colleagues, I study how to how to communicate about biology. Um, I like to call it the science of science communication. Um, and most of my research has been focused on how to teach um, controversial topics in biology. So um, topics that we might be teaching in biology classes that uh, might conflict with student identities like climate change and politics, or um, a lot of my research has been on religion and evolution. And how do we teach evolution in a way um, that is comfortable for students of faith because evolution is a really important part of teaching biology, especially at the college level. And so your research found what? That, that the way we currently teach evolution is, is having an impact in, in maybe a negative way or what, what did your research find? Yeah, so a lot of what my research is finding is that the perception of conflict between religion and evolution is much greater than the reality of what conflict actually needs to exist between religion and evolution. And oftentimes in the college classroom, instructors are teaching evolution in a way that seems like it has to be conflictual uh, with evolution. So for instance, in one of my most recent studies, we found that almost half of college biology students across the nation thought that in order to accept evolution, that you would have to be an atheist in order to do that. Um, but that's a misconception. Uh, science is actually technically agnostic. It's not um, atheistic at all. It doesn't say anything about the existence or non-existence of God. Um, so that um, makes us wonder as science communicators or science educators, how are we teaching evolution in a way that's propagating these misconceptions about the conflict between science and or religion and evolution? This has been a conflict for a long time. And you said it's greater than it needs to be. Where do you put the responsibility for that? Is that more with teachers, um, you know, I guess the scientific community, or is it more with the religious community? I think it's with absolutely both. Um, I think that, you know, in the religious community, uh, I think one reason that you see some conflict, perception of conflict in science classrooms between religion and evolution is because of um, historical legal battles in which religious groups have tried to get um, special creationism to be taught in science classrooms in place of evolution, which in some senses has put, uh, you know, scientists on the defensive about teaching evolution in a way that can be compatible with religion. But on the same, on the same note, as scientists, we have a responsibility to communicate science in a way that is scientifically rigorous, um, but is also um, accessible to the general public, right? So to teach evolution in the way now, uh, where sometimes we're not clear about the fact that religion and evolution can be compatible, I think is is on us to uh, to do better in our science communication. And what's at stake here? If if there is this divide, what does that then mean? Yeah, so one thing that I that I always point out um, to my colleagues when I'm trying to talk to them about how to teach evolution and um, to students of faith is that 75% of the American public identifies as Christian, right? And um, a lot of the issues that we see that intersect with biology education, like climate change or evolution, vaccines, or even nowadays COVID-19 mitigation, there is a, an intersection with the religious community and how they're talking about 
um, these issues and responding to these issues based on their religious identity. And if there is this perception that there is a boundary between the religious community and the science community, there is some kind of rift between the religious community and the science community, that this isn't going to bode well for people um, taking the recommendations of the scientific community. Um, so I've always said that, you know, the fact that we have so few religious individuals in science is a problem. Um, you know, I said 75% of the American public identifies as Christian, only 25% of biologists identify as Christian. So what that means is we already have kind of a cultural difference between scientists and religious individuals that may need some um, attending to, right? So we want to be careful about how we're discussing the relationship between religion and science, especially on these issues like evolution, where religion and science tend to rub up against each other the most. And it also impacts uh, minorities, right? It does it mean that, that certain groups are maybe less likely to even go into this field? Yeah, so I'm really glad that you brought that out. So the most recent paper that we published was specifically focused on how this perception of conflict between religion and evolution might actually be impacting minority students in biology classes. So one thing that we often don't think about is the fact that students of color and women even tend to be more religious on average than white men. And in science disciplines, um, in, in particularly, we get concerned about the fact that white men are overrepresented in the field and we have very few ethnic minority students or women. And so once again, now, if we're talking about evolution in a way that's conflictual with a student's religious identity, then we may actually be inadvertently dissuading students of color and women um, from feeling like they belong in the scientific community or within evolution biology specifically because there's a big um, <clears throat> there's a scarcity I guess right of, of minorities you'd like to see more minorities going into this field and you have identified this may be one thing that is I guess turning them off I, I won't say it's a barrier yeah. maybe it is a barrier it is, I think, you know, it, it is a barrier. You know, the extent of that barrier is still yet to be discovered. But um, but what we definitely see, you can even see it within biology. So within biology, there are some disciplines in which evolution is, is less um, focused on than others. So for instance, like biomedical sciences um, or nursing uh, doctorates versus fields like evolutionary biology, you see more ethnic minorities and women in those other fields that focus on evolution less and are more friendly um, to kind of religious ideals and communities. We also see that religious women are one of the most underrepresented groups. So we, a large percentage of the American population consists of religious women. But when you look in the scientists uh, and the sciences, religious women are particularly underrepresented um, compared to non-religious women. So what is the solution? The solution is what? So I think that it's, I think a lot of times that we, that we tend to focus on the, the conflict between religion and evolution and potential conflict between religion and evolution. But as I said, that perceived conflict is greater than the reality. There are specific areas um, of religious ideals that might conflict with evolution, but it's actually very narrow. Um, these are, uh, this is if an individual um, takes the Bible in a literal way and believes that all species had to be created separately from one another in seven days, right? So it's a it's actually a, a minority of people that have that specific religious belief. Um, uh, but in all other ways, evolution is actually completely compatible with religion. Um, there are a large percentage of people that accept what's called theistic evolution. So this is this idea that um, a god or god, depending on what religion you know you're you're coming from, um, somehow started, planned, or guided evolution, right? And as as uh, scientists, we say nothing about whether or not God had anything to do with that process, right? We're agnostic. Right? But as a religious individual, whether or not you think that God had something to do with that process is a personal and religious journey for yourself. Right, And I think that right now, as scientists, at least on our end, as scientists, we don't highlight those things enough. Um, about where these, these things can be compatible. And we, we also have leaders in the field that are um, advocates for evolutionary biology and evolution education, um, but are also highly religious individuals themselves. So for instance, um, Dr. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health, and he's also a self-identified evangelical Christian. 
He also started this whole organization called BioLogos, and I recommend it to any um, individuals of faith who are interested in exploring these issues on evolution, religion, and science. Um, it's called BioLogos, and he founded this whole organization to explore the areas in which evolution and religion can be compatible. Um, so highlighting some of those, like uh, what I call boundary spanners in the scientific community is also really important for for um, bringing down these barriers between the religious and scientific community. So you're talking about highlighting the the compatibility, the things that, that are are similar. And so you know, yeah. take it take you know, 101 for me would be the Big Bang theory, right? I mean, then and then there's the the biblical story. How how mm -hmm. could you put those together? I, I've I've always thought that you you could say, well, God, you know, was responsible for the Big Bang. I mean, I don't know that it means that. The, if you believe in, in that, then you have to throw everything out in the Bible. But I'll let you describe that, perhaps, if, if that's yeah. what you're saying here. So one of the most fundamental things people start to talk about is the timeline of Genesis. So if we're talking about Christianity specifically, then the timeline of Genesis is something that people talk about, whether or not, you know, the seven days described in the Bible is a literal seven days, or could it be representative of something larger? Um, it doesn't have to be those literal seven days, right? And and the parts about, um, you know, whether groups of organisms were made separately from one another, does that actually have to be taken literally? And individuals, um, you know, there's been a lot of scholarly work done on you know, which parts of the Bible should should be taken literally versus which are more seen as poetry or story um, to, to convey some kind of moral some kind of moral point. And it's not necessarily a matter of if some parts of the Bible should be taken literally or not, but which parts of the Bible. And there's a lot of indication that Genesis, you know, this part of the Bible in which creation is very much focused on and therefore um, can come up in conflict with evolution the most, um, there's a lot of indication that, that that particular story is meant to be taken as an allegory rather than the literal interpretation. So that's just one way that individuals have reconciled religion with evolution is to look at that that creation story as more of an allegory than a literal interpretation of how creation um, occurred. All right, we have to take a break, but I want to I want to take a break, and then we'll we'll come back, and I'll, I want to discuss how this was received. I mean, I, I could see sure. some longtime uh, professor saying, "No, we're not going to bend what we're teaching <laughs> here." You know, let, I, I just want to talk about how this was perceived, where, where we go going forward. So we'll take a break. Be back right after this.